Before I begin this episode, I want to let you know that I have a new show called Somewhere Sinister, which is available on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. It's a weekly show where, each season, we pick a location and tell you sinister stories from that area. In Season 1, we take you to the Pacific Northwest where you'll hear about a cult, multiple murders, and a failed train robbery. Just search for Somewhere Sinister on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. The first episode is up now. The Molala Forest is located south of Portland, Oregon, in the Molala State Park. Both get their name from the Molala tribe of Native Americans who lived in the Cascade Mountains in Oregon, from Mount Hood in the north to Mount McLaughlin to the south. Today, the park is 567 acres and offers places for people to go camping, hiking, and hunting. The town of Molala sits to the north of the Molala Forest and just west of the Molala River. It's a small town of about 9,000 residents, and they installed their first stoplight in 2002 at the intersection of Highway 211 and Highway 213. Dayton Rogers was a husband, father, and business owner who lived a seemingly normal life during the day, but at night, he took to the streets to fulfill fantasies that needed to be carried out deep in the forest where nobody could hear the screams. This is Monsters. On August 31, 1987, Everett Lee Banyard set out into the Molala Forest with his crossbow to catch himself a deer. He drove out to a very secluded area and began looking for signs of deer activity. As he followed what he initially thought was damaged ferns caused by an animal, it soon became clear that the tracks were man-made. As he came to a group of more crushed ferns, he also noticed a foul smell. As he moved the plants around with his boot, he was horrified to see not an animal carcass, but the body of a human being. He hiked back to his truck and drove home, where he called the Clackamas County Sheriff's Department. Deputy Randy Oxford soon arrived at Everett's home and took a report of what the man had seen. Then, Everett led the deputy out to the body. Once Oxford got a glimpse of the body tucked under the ferns, he called it in and secured the scene. The following morning, the medical examiner reported that the body was mummified and completely nude. They found that the left foot was missing, but couldn't determine if it was due to animals or if it was taken by the perpetrator. As the medical examiner was working to uncover the body, a second body was discovered. This one was also nude, and it had both feet missing. These had clearly been sawed or cut off at the ankles. As Detectives Mike Machado and Jim Strovink cleared the area around the two bodies, they collected anything that could be evidence, including the soil and the dead ferns that had once been covering the remains. They collected a white plastic bottle, a glass liquor bottle, a beer can, another metal can of some kind that was completely rusted, and a piece of red cord. As the investigators worked their way out further away from the bodies, Detective Strovink found another body. The third body was laying face up, with no clothes on, about 15 feet from the other two, and it had been cut open from the groin to the chest, with the spine visible through the wound. At this point, authorities realized that they needed to leave the area and set up some type of formal search grid in order to make sure they found all of the remains before they started processing more evidence. They had clearly stumbled onto the dumping ground of a serious predator. They brought in a canine unit with a cadaver dog named Colt. Soon, Colt had found body number four about 40 feet away from body number three. This one was also lying face up, nude, and partially covered by ferns and dirt. This body was mostly skeletonized. Over an hour later, a deputy called out that he had found body number five. It was about 50 yards from body number four and was also nude. It was lying face down in the brush and had some odd-shaped injuries to the lower back and buttocks. Their hands were tied behind their back with a thin green belt and the right foot was missing. During the search, a foot that would later be identified as belonging to body number one was found and placed into an evidence bag. Once authorities were sure they had thoroughly searched the area, the medical examiner came back in and resumed his examination of the bodies. 
As he completed working on body number one, they loaded it into a yellow body bag. They then repeated the process with the other four bodies and transported them back to the medical examiner's office for autopsy. Authorities initially thought that this might be the work of the Green River Killer. From 1992 to 1998, Gary Ridgway murdered at least 49 women in Washington state. In 1987, authorities in Washington didn't know the identity of who would become one of the worst serial killers in the world, but they had a task force set up trying to bring the killer to justice. In 1985, two sets of remains were found near Portland that were thought to be the work of the Green River Killer, so the remains found in the Molala Forest wouldn't be a huge stretch to connect to the others. The Green River Killer was targeting sex workers and that seemed to be the theme of the victims in this case. Detective Machado notified the Green River Killer Task Force about their discovery and talked to a detective in Washington, making sure to keep them apprised of their progress in the investigation. Jenny Smith was 26 years old, working on Union Avenue. She was wearing a gray and white striped Nike sweatshirt, tight jeans, pink socks, and tennis shoes. Jenny had already satisfied five or six customers the evening of August 6th into the morning of August 7th, 1987. When a light blue Nissan pickup pulled up to the curb at about 1.30 a.m., Jenny recognized the driver immediately. The man said his name was Steve and she had been picked up by him multiple times before. She knew he was friendly and paid well, so she had no apprehension hopping into the passenger side of the pickup. Jenny wasn't the skinniest amongst her peers, but she was a well-endowed woman and her repeat customer liked that. Steve kept a case of miniature bottles of Smirnoff vodka in his truck and would usually grab a few individual plastic bottles of orange juice just before he went looking for a date. He would open a bottle of juice, take a swig to make room in the bottle, then pour in a miniature of vodka. He would drink these to loosen himself up and prepare for what he had in mind for the night. He would also make a drink for his date, and if they turned it down, he would insist that they drink it. Steve had a secluded spot that he liked to take women, but it wasn't close and Jenny didn't want to spend extra time driving. She made her money by finishing a date and going out and finding another customer. This night, for some reason, Steve decided to stay closer to town with his date. It's unknown if it was his decision or if Jenny convinced him to stay closer. Steve drove them south on Highway 99 out of Portland to the small town of Oak Grove. At just before 3 a.m., they pulled into a secluded area in the back of a parking lot and began their activities. Jenny removed her clothes and Steve used the laces from her tennis shoes to tie her up. Jenny knew that this customer liked to tie up his dates and had some unusual sexual fetishes, but as long as the money was right, she was game for almost anything. Tonight, though, Steve was ready to take things to a level that Jenny was not game for. With Jenny tied up and at the mercy of her sadistic date, Steve's eyes suddenly went cold and he grabbed a kitchen knife. Jenny struggled to see what he was doing and when she realized what he had in his hand, she started screaming. He dragged the blade across her back, relishing her pain. The more she squirmed, the more she screamed, the more excited he got. As Jenny turned her body to protect her back, Steve made a deep cut on one of her nipples. Normally, this activity would arouse Steve so much that he would masturbate over the woman, but her screams were so loud and this parking lot wasn't as secluded as his favorite location, so he didn't have a lot of time. In a frenzy, he took the knife blade and penetrated Jenny, raping her with the sharp object. The blood flowed from her body, which made Steve shriek with delight. With time running out before someone would respond to her screams, Steve began stabbing Jenny repeatedly in the torso. The intense pain gave Jenny a boost of adrenaline, and her struggle finally paid off as the shoelaces broke. She swung her hands up, trying to fend off the knife-wielding maniac as she struggled to find the door handle. As the door swung open, the woman, now covered in blood, fell to the pavement. She tried to run, but Steve was right behind her, and when he caught up to her, he began stabbing her furiously. He was enraged by the nerve of this woman to deny him his outlet. The nerve of this woman wanting to stay alive. He hated her now more than anything in the world. Now she definitely deserved to die. Though Steve picked a dark secluded parking lot to carry out his date, it wasn't far from a Denny's restaurant that was open all night. 
This may have worked out better at another time, but the pair arrived at the parking lot just after the local bars had closed, so people were making their way from the bar to the Denny's to get something to eat after a night of drinking. As one man, James Dalkey, was walking into the restaurant, and another man, Kurt Thilke, was walking out, they both saw the two people struggling in the adjacent parking lot. When they heard a scream for help, James looked at Kurt, a stranger to him, and said, let's check it out. When they got close enough to see that a man was on top of a woman, who clearly didn't want him there, James yelled, what the fuck do you think you're doing? When Steve turned his head and saw the men, he jumped up and ran behind the building next to the parking lot. Roger said he considered chasing the man, but he saw a knife in his hand and decided against it. When they focused their attention on Jenny, they saw that she was covered in blood. Blood was pouring from a wound on her neck and oozing from gashes in her abdomen. Kurt ran back to the Denny's to call 911 as other patrons of the restaurant came out to investigate. Charles Gates was experienced in emergency medical treatment and he didn't let the fact that he was in a wheelchair stop him from helping. He pushed himself out of the chair and onto his knees and checked for a pulse, but couldn't find one. He began CPR as Roger put pressure on her neck wound, trying to slow the bleeding. These two men immediately put everything else out of their mind and did everything they could to save the life of this stranger. While that was going on, Steve had snuck around the back of the building and was working his way back to his truck, trying not to be spotted in the now well-populated parking lot. When he thought the coast was clear, he didn't run, but walked casually to his truck. He was spotted, and someone shouted, That's him! Get his license plate number! But unfortunately, it was too dark for anyone to see it well enough. Steve drove out of the parking lot with his lights off onto a gravel road that turned out to be a dead end. Two of the Denny's customers moved their cars in front of the parking lot exits to try to stop the murderous man from getting away, but Steve jumped the curb and fled south on southeast McLaughlin. Richard Bergio jumped into his car and sped off down the road to try to get the license plate number. Even though the perpetrator had turned his lights on by now, the lights for his license plate weren't on. Richard was determined to identify the man who committed the most horrendous act he had ever seen. Driving nearly 100 miles per hour, Richard got right on the bumper of the Nissan pickup and was finally able to see the license plate, Oregon State Plate Number CYW194. Detective John Turner was assigned as lead detective on the case, and when he ran the license plate number, it came back as a 1985 blue Nissan pickup, exactly as witnesses described. The vehicle was registered to a Dayton Rogers, who lived in Canby, a small town just south of Portland. Dayton Rogers was born on September 30, 1953 in Moscow, Idaho. Even though his father, Ordis Rogers, never wanted children in the first place, the couple would have three children of their own, Dayton and two daughters. His mother, Jasperell, loved children and wanted a lot, so on top of their children, they also adopted two more girls and another boy. Ordis was a harsh disciplinarian who would dispense sudden and violent physical abuse upon all the children. They were often left bleeding and or covered with bruises. His parents were devout members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church with very conservative ideas about sex. It was almost completely censored from their home. His father went so far as to draw clothes on the hula dancers on the cover of a book so they wouldn't be showing any skin. He told his children that any woman who had any sexual activity before marriage, even kissing, should be stoned. Not with marijuana, like hit with rocks. During his childhood, Dayton developed an interest in his sister's feet. People who knew them said the girls were constantly looking for their shoes and it was because their brother would take them at night and masturbate while holding them. As he grew up, he grew to hate his father for the way he treated him and also his mother for not protecting him. In 1972, at the age of 19, Dayton met and married a 16-year-old girl named Julie in Eugene, Oregon. Julie wasn't a Seventh-day Adventist and had been in treatment for drug and alcohol abuse, so Dayton's parents were not happy about the union. The month after he got married, Dayton was arrested for attacking a 15-year-old girl with a knife. On August 25, 1972, the girl had been brought into the hospital by Dayton, who claimed he found her on the road with a stab wound in her abdomen. She told the doctor that she stabbed herself, but he doubted her story. She eventually admitted that she had met Dayton the day before and the two drove out to the woods and had sex. 
The next day, they met back up and went back out to the same woods where they had sex again. As she was laying on the ground, Dayton suddenly stabbed her in the abdomen with a hunting knife. When he told her that he did it because he couldn't trust her anymore, she told him that she loved him. At this point, he said, Oh my God, what have I done? Then he proposed to her, you know, like you do after you stab someone. He agreed to take her to the hospital if she told the doctors that she stabbed herself. When they talked to Dayton, he eventually admitted to stabbing the girl and claimed the devil must have taken over. He pleaded guilty to second-degree assault and was sentenced to four years of probation, no jail time. Six months later, Dayton was back in police custody after attacking two teenage runaways with a broken beer bottle. This time, when he was interviewed by a psychiatrist, the doctor determined that Dayton had manifested pseudo-sociopathic schizophrenia. The judge found him not guilty by reason of insanity and he was remanded to the Oregon State Hospital in Salem. His confinement in the psychiatric hospital was the final straw for his wife, Julie, and she moved back to California and filed for divorce. Dayton was working to get released from the hospital by following his doctor's instructions to the letter. The thing about a sociopath is that one of the signs is that they know how to tell people what they want to hear. They know how to manipulate people into believing there's something that they aren't. As far as the hospital staff could see, Dayton had recovered from his mental illness to a degree that he was no longer a menace to himself or others. He was released from the Oregon State Hospital on December 12, 1974. Three months after being released from the psychiatric hospital, Dayton met a girl named Sherry Miller. The couple were married on October 25, 1975. Even though he was having sex with multiple women as well as his wife, Dayton wasn't satisfied. At the beginning of December 1975, Dayton and Sherry got into a fight and the husband stormed out of the house. He ended up meeting a young girl and convinced her to go with him to a place where she could have a puppy. When he got her to a secluded area, he attacked the girl, tied her up, and raped her. She was able to convince Dalton to untie her so she could urinate, and once she was out of the car, she ran. She got to a nearby house, and the residents let her inside and called the sheriff. The girl was surprised that Dayton hadn't chased after her in his car, but it turned out that he was stuck in the mud and authorities had no problem finding him. He was released while they investigated and told his wife that it was a case of mistaken identity, but he was eventually charged with the rape. While the trial was pending, Dayton was free to terrorize more young girls in the area, leading him to be charged with three other rapes. Those charges got him two five-year sentences, and despite being urged by authorities not to release him early, Dayton was paroled in January of 1982. He was released from parole a year later. Dayton Rogers was once again free to have his way with the women around Portland, Oregon. On August 31, 1978, Detective John Turner had arrested Dayton Rogers for the murder of Jenny Smith, and he was working on the case when he got a call to go to a crime scene in the Molala Forest. As the medical examiner was going over the details of body number one, Turner was focused on a miniature bottle of Smirnoff vodka laying under a fern near the body. He asked one of the deputies to make sure he picked up the bottle, and the deputy told him that they were all over the place. As Detective Turner was walking along a trail telling Detective Machado that he believed their serial killer was currently in jail for the murder of Jenny Smith, they began smelling an unfortunately familiar odor. As they left the trail and followed the smell, they found some human bones, but it was clearly not an entire body. After walking another 30 feet, they came to a spot in the dirt where it was clear the body had decayed, but the bones had been moved, possibly by animals. As they continued walking, they found another set of skeletonized remains. There were teeth marks by animals, but you could also clearly make out stab marks in the chest bones. When authorities were done, they found the remains of seven bodies in the Molala Forest the summer of 1987. Authorities scoured missing person reports in an effort to identify the bodies from the Molala Forest. With a lot of hard work and help from different agencies and family members, Dayton Rogers had killed 23-year-old Lisa Mock, 26-year-old Maureen Hodges, 21-year-old Cynthia DeVore, 35-year-old Christine Adams, 26-year-old Nondis Cervantes, 16-year-old Retha Giles, and 25-year-old Jenny Smith. One body remained unidentified. 
On top of the murders, Dayton raped and assaulted countless other young women. Authorities had two cases against Dayton Rogers. First, he was charged with aggravated murder for the death of Jenny Smith. Dayton pleaded not guilty to those charges. He claimed that he killed Jenny in self-defense. According to his defense attorney, Jenny had noticed that Dayton had over $200 in cash in his wallet and decided to rob him. According to the defense, Jenny waited until they were at the parking lot where she grabbed a knife out of the glove box and held it to his throat, demanding his wallet. When Dayton refused to hand over his wallet, a struggle ensued and Jenny was stabbed multiple times leading to her accidental death. These were claims that were not difficult for the district attorney to disprove. First were the physical injuries on Jenny's body. They weren't injuries from a couple of accidental stab wounds. Also, witnesses testified that they heard Jenny screaming for help for at least two minutes in the parking lot that morning. When they got to the commotion, Dayton was on top of the woman. He was clearly the aggressor. Then there was a steady stream of other women who had survived an attack by Dayton. They all took the stand and described being tied up and tortured for hours. The DA even brought in parts of Dayton's truck to show multiple stab marks and blood from multiple people. He also brought up the fact that Jenny was completely nude when Good Samaritans arrived to help her. If she was going to rob Dayton, wouldn't she have put her clothes back on first? Was she going to take his wallet and run off nude? It just didn't make sense. The jury agreed, and after 13 hours of deliberations, they found Dayton Rogers guilty of aggravated murder and he was sentenced to life in prison. The following year, Dayton was found guilty of the aggravated murders of the six identified women who were found in the Molala Forest. Dayton Rogers was sentenced to death by lethal injection. The Oregon Supreme Court overturned Dayton's death sentence three times, giving him a new trial, and at all three new trials, he was again sentenced to death. In 2021, the Supreme Court overturned his death sentence again, this time citing a law change that makes his crime not fit into the guidelines that would make him eligible for the death penalty. Though the law change specifically stated that it wasn't retroactive, meaning it didn't apply to people already sentenced to death, the Supreme Court stated they believed the new law did apply retroactively. So, the Oregon Supreme Court is wasting money having Dayton go through another trial when clearly people want him to die. He's never getting out of prison either way, which is good, but he's clearly broken and just needs to be put down. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please talk to your local battered women's shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. The great thing about this website is that, at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught looking for help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility, call 911, or call Mental Health America, who operate the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and will talk to you about any mental health issue you might be facing. Thanks so much for watching this video. You can help us out by hitting the like button or leaving us a comment. You can also subscribe to the show to ensure you don't miss an episode. If you'd like to support the show, you can do that by checking out our merchandise at Teespring. You can also discuss the channel and the episodes on our subreddit, r forward slash this is monsters. You can find more ways to support our show and how to find us on social media by visiting thisismonsters.com. Thanks again and be safe.